participate on Treaty 6 territory here in Saskatchewan, Canada. And I also want to note that there are, there are many scholars in the Wolf community who have analyzed Orlando. Some of them are in the room here with us today. And I don't want to suggest that my reading of the text invalidates any of these other readings, but rather that in reading Orlando alongside Elby's Man into Woman, I aim only to highlight a pivotal difference between Orlando and other trans characters in modernism and suggest that perhaps the former could or should be read as other than transgender. The stakes of my argument is the vital importance of representation for trans people, always relevant, but I'm feeling lately perhaps particularly so given recent and evolving political challenges for trans people worldwide even when considering modernist characters and texts in the context of their own era. What separates Orlando from other trans characters in literary modernism is her transformation, a combination of the way that the narration of this moment implies that gender stems from physical biology, and also more pivotally, that the transformation is imposed upon Orlando instead of stemming from any premeditated desire on Orlando's part to self-actualize this female gender identity. Gender identity is in fact largely an afterthought in the text overall, not completely non-existent, but, but not as, as prevalent as other things, derived from Orlando's body, but without reflection on the protagonist's part. Instead, when Orlando delves into introspection at all, the focus is on gender roles and the restrictions on women in British society. Orlando's transformation is a means to this end for Wolf at times. I choose to compare Orlando with Lily Elby because both, because both of their narratives involve a physical transition, an altering of the body. Pamela Cahey and Sabine Meyer, editors of the recent scholarly edition of Elby's Man into Woman, have noted that Lily, who expresses some admittedly highly idiosyncratic views about her identity, should not be read either as a standard bearer for some generalized trans experience. All the same, Lily does possess what Gail Salomon calls embodied subjectivity or trans subjectivity. A trans person's sense of themselves that intersects with the body and embodiment, but yet is not derived of the body, a necessary deviation given that the umbrella term trans indicates Above all else, an identity inconsistent with the person's biological sex. Jay Prosser articulates a similar concept of trans people as constructing subjects, the sole authors of their own identities, who deliberately constru construct a new sense of themselves. Lily, for example, consciously feels prior to transitioning that her male sex as assigned at birth does not accurately reflect who she feels herself to be. Orlando, meanwhile, lacks this trans subjectivity, this self-constructing directive. She becomes a woman simply because her body changes, not because she expresses any internal desire to do so. Moreover, after her transformation, her chief struggles concern the realm of social habits and learned behaviors. She never really fears mis being misgendered or never struggles with doubt. Lily, unlike Orlando, experiences dysphoria and fears of rejection, but accompanying her much more conscious and personal process of bodily change, she also experiences euphoria and the restorative joy of a realized and affirmed transgender identity. I don't think I can stress enough that this sense of joy, of becoming, of arriving, is a pivotal and positive part of trans experiences. Kahi has cautioned against seeking out literal transgender in the modernist past, which is fair, but all the same, perhaps when we can identify them via fully realized trans subjectivities, figures like Lily represent trans people in the modernist era in a way that Orlando cannot. Orlando's gender is derived from her biology from the text's opening page, where the narrator declares that there could be no doubt of his sex, though the fashion of the time did something to conceal it, implying a biologically male figure underneath somewhat feminine clothing. Likewise, her transformation is noted quite simply. Orlando awakes from a deep sleep and her nakedness reveals her to be a woman. She stands upright and looks herself up and down while the narrator states, Orlando had become a woman. There could be no denying it. The implication, 
is that Orlando's body has changed, that there could be no denying it based on her physical form and therefore her gender is changed as well. Yet Orlando doesn't reflect on this at all, has no real subjective position on the matter. The narrator, who could also provide some clarity, instead leaves the question to biologists and psychologists, evades the issue entirely, and furthermore, espouses the view that sex and sexuality are odious subjects. Yet we also learn that other than her bodily change, Orlando remained precisely as she had been, that her mind remains the same, yet her gender has changed, has reinforces the conflation of sex and gender inherent in this presentation of Orlando's gender identity. And Wolf effectively rejects the opportunity for Orlando to formulate a trans subjective position at this critical juncture. Her one significant moment of reflection on her identity happens later, just before she arrives back in England, when she seems to vacillate between man and woman, but is also not sure to which she belongs. By the end of the same page, however, she aligns herself with women and refers to men as the other sex, but still without any elucidation of her decision. When she cries, cries sorry, praise God that I'm a woman, the narrator also cautions us against the extreme folly of being proud of her sex before moving on, again, just complicating our understanding of why, if not simply because of her altered biology, Orlando has ultimately chosen this identity. And consequently, as Chris Kaufman argues, Orlando as a character lacks a coherent sense of a singular identity. Orlando's rare moments of introspection are often reserved for other matters. Her reflections on what it means to be a woman are effectively utilized as a metaphorical thought experiment of what someone with the learned behaviors, attitudes, and privileges of a man would think if forced by circumstances to explore instead the role of a woman. We learn that while living with the Roma people, she had scarcely given her sex a thought. But it is admittedly striking that Orlando would have given her gender no thought whatsoever in the time directly succeeding her transformation. After her later moment of indecision and vacillation, her reflections on board the enamored lady as she returns to England are largely concerned with gender roles and societal expectations as she reacclimates to English society. Madeline Detloff highlights the role of camp in this criticism of gender roles. For example, when Orlando bears an ankle, and later in Orlando's dreary and unsolicited courtship with the Archduke Harry, camp and satire take center of stage, and Orlando's status as an ostensibly transgender woman become merely a means to exploring this end of what it means to be a woman in this society. Kahi also explores this territory in her article, The Temporality of Modernist Life Writing, and compares the bridge between genders that Orlando embodies as more of an experiment in writing than an exploration of the body. I extend this analogy further. Orlando can occupy a unique space where she can explore the conventions that restrict women with self-knowledge of male privilege, but her status as a man who has become a woman is still subordinated to the more general concerns of what it means to be a woman in society. Orlando is also based, at least loosely, on Wolf's lover, Vita Sackville West. Vita is willing to articulate her sense of herself. Brenda Helt notes that she believed herself to be able to shift between the two binary genders according to dress, context, and sexual desire. Vita is, quite possibly, expressing a sort of trans subjectivity in this articulation of becoming a different gender, a possible analog to a modern gender fluid identity. Yet Wolf offers no indication that Orlando occupies a similar subjective position. Orlando echoes Vita most when, after her transformation, she dresses as a man and seeks out female sex workers. But these scenes instead highlight Orlando's love of both sexes equally, that is, her bisexuality. And she still does not formulate or express any trans subjective positions in these encounters that would be comp comparable with Vita's. For Lily, on the other hand, her assigned sex at birth is a source of constant concern to her. And until she transitions, she struggles to situate herself in the world. Historically, 
Lily Elby was one of the first transgender women, people to undergo a medical transition and man into woman chronicles her life both before and after this moment. Kahi and Meyer point out factual inaccuracies in the text and, and Lily is also not a perfect ant antecedent to modern transgender people. But in describing her life prior to transitioning, she talks about Andrea Spar, the dead name she uses for herself in the text in the third person as if Andreas were another person with whom she shared a single body before being able to leave completely as Lily after her second surgery. But for all this, I think that the textual Lily can be thought of as a semi-fictional character who still provides a poignant point of comparison with Orlando as another figure of literary modernism who undergoes a physical transition, but who consciously seeks out this change and also reflects much more meaningfully on, upon what it means for her. Lily's pre-transition despair and despondency while living a double and semi-closeted life stem at least partially from the fact she does not view total and final separation from this supposedly separate persona of Andreas as possible until she meets the surgeon who performs her gender-affirming surgeries and helps her attain legal status as well as a woman. Pivotally, though, this change is driven by Lily herself. She feels that she was never intended to be anything but a woman. The Andreas persona, persona, which, you know, it's hard not to separate from also being part of Lily, right? Willingly, enthusiastically even, submits to a procedure that they both believe, the Lily and Andreas personas that are presented separately in the text, will eliminate this part of her and allow the Lily persona to take sole possession of their shared body. Lily's desire for bodily change is therefore a conscious process, as the two personas agree that only imminent death awaited had the transition been po not been possible. They feel on the edge of depression to the extent that Andreas essentially commit, uh, considers suicide as the alternative to transition. After her second surgery, only Lily is present. Andreas seemingly gone forever. Lily has now transitioned, is fully out as trans. And it is if, if she has been newly birthed, but through her own volition, in her own words, fully conscious through her own pangs. Lily is poignantly aware as well of the tenuous nature of her position within society. She knows that people look upon her as a phenomenon, an experiment, and associates this with negative feelings. She feels fears being misgendered when out in public and her sister's constant dead naming and rejection of her transition is particularly painful to her. She feels that she has to demonstrate every day to her sister that she is in fact a woman. Salomon describes this challenge for trans people, the difficulty of reconciling how they are perceived from the outside compared with their internal sense of themselves. But something we also see in Lily is the inverse, the pure euphoria that life as a woman brings her after her, tra after her transition. She is happy, walking quite naturally, like a young woman, among other young women. These moments provide a powerful antidote to her fears. She fears, feels secure and salvaged. How delightful it is to be addressed as madam, she writes. The congruence of how she is perceived and how she wishes to be perceived that she gets after transitioning is euphoric. And these simple joys are representative of the less discussed positive side of transgender lived experiences. For Lily, after her transition, these small moments interspersed throughout the narrative as she navigates other challenges cannot be undervalued. She finds in them the reconciliation of outer and inner perceptions. Her gender is affirmed and it is because of her deeply felt sense of trans subjectivity that she is able to articulate how and why this matters to her. Orlando must suffer through the odious routines of decorum and convention, but her sense of gender identity is not an issue for her at any time, even after an incredible transformation. Lily, meanwhile, must actively work to come into her own. And as a result, is able to express a deep appreciation for being seen and validated as a woman. It is this pivotal difference between Lily and Orlando that highlights what Orlando as both text and character lacks to some extent. 
It is not Orlando's fantastical transformation that is the issue, but her lack of an active desire for it or reflection upon it afterwards. Transgender identification, I would, I would argue, cannot exist without introspection. It must be consciously actualized. Lily does that. It is Lily who feels real. She provides a baseline for the limits of reading Orlando, an interesting experiment and an endlessly fascinating character, to be sure, about which so much can be said. But all the same, perhaps not a transgender one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, we'll take a two minute break now and people can gather their thoughts, write down some questions. We'll have questions at the very end in Q and A, but you know, just write down some notes for now and we'll be back at 11.22. Recording. Take it away, Manuela. Hello. <laughs> so just to preface before I kind of jump into reading my access copy. Um, so this comes out of a much larger paper that I did in my final course in grad school, um, a, a much larger paper. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of focusing on the applications of queer space uh, in particular. And I touch a little bit on kind of the interactions between queer time and space towards the end of the essay. But just to let you know, if something seems unfinished, it probably exists to some capacity. Um, so I hope that this kind of uh, reaches the audience. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna kind of talk about um, a theoretical introduction of the ways of queer space that I'm looking in um, and looking towards through the kind of reading I did of Orlando. So the conceptualizations of queer time and queer space are inextricably linked. According to Jack Halberstam, queer space refers to the place-making practices within postmodernism in which queer people engage, and it also describes the new understandings of space enabled by the production of queer counterpublics. This definition refers primarily to the modern conception of urbanized spaces that allow for queer creativity. However, Aaron Betsky offers a deeper discussion of queer space. Instead of walls, floors, and ceilings, here was a space that appeared and disappeared continually. Here was a place where the most intimate acts, whether real or acted out in dance, occurred in full view. Here was only rhythm and light. This was queer space. Betsky organizes his discussion into three subgroups. First, the closet, second, the mirror, and third, orgasm. The closet acts as an artificial sense of security, surrounded by an ever-changing world. This is a place for queer people to strip away the masks and costumes they wear to pass or appear straight in public. Here, a queer space is born. The closet operates as a duly constructed and artificial womb that offers both sanctuary and storage space for the past. It is a place for the construction of identity and theorizations of the future. The mirror, although seemingly like the closet, is more bodily in that it provides the onlooker with a visual view of their physical body. The mirror is where you and your world, including your body, your clothes, and the objects you have collected around yourself, come back to you in an ordered fashion. It is an alternate world that is unreal because it is merely a reflection that is both constraining and freeing. Mirror space is free and open, shifting and ephemeral, and yet constrained by its lack of reality. As soon as you look away from it, it ceases to function. The final subgroup of Betsky's application of queer space is orgasm. Orgasm functions as both the goal of queer space and as its own space. This is the space in which your body dissolves into the world and your senses smooth all reality into continuous waves of pleasure. A space of orgasm lasts only for a moment, but during that moment, you give yourself over to pure pleasure, which leaves one in a state of happy vulnerability. This space serves as an apex in one's timeline wherein all other moments fade and become fade or become lackluster in comparison. This ternary plot consisting of the three variable spaces of the closet, mirror, and space of orgasm sums to the facilitation of queer space and its ability to appropriate certain aspects of the material world in which we all live, composes them into an unreal or artificial space, and uses this counter construction to create the free space of orgasm that dissolves the material or heteronormative world. For Orlando, the closet is not necessarily a physical entity, but rather a metaphorical space of privacy and solitude. Furthermore, Orlando's queer space in the form of a metaphorical closet not only enables his sexual metamorphosis, but also confounds the very narrative that describes it, thus indicating how this space overrides the normative space. 
Through his proclivity to be in solitude, Orlando experiences a kind of cocooning from the material world around him that he so frequently experienced as a male appointed nobleman in the pages leading up to his transition from male to female or his metamorphosis. Before this chapter of solitude and mystery, Orlando is described as the very image of a noble gentleman. Even though this chapter prefaces that it is highly unfortunate and unusual at this stage of Orlando's career, when he played a most important part in the public life of his country, we have the least information to go upon. The biographer does not explicitly reveal why they are lacking the materials needed to stay consistent in their detailed accounts of Orlando's life. However, I attest that this lack of biographical materials is intentional on behalf of the biographer, wherein they are both creating a closet space for Orlando to cocoon and construct their identity and to highlight their knowledge of what is to come. The biographer inserts themselves to offer a solution for readers in this predicament of a lack of biographical information. It is with fragments such as these that we must do our best to make up a picture of Orlando's life and character at this time. As Orlando has been put under the pressure of marriage to Rosina Pepita and his new role as Duke, he sinks into a profound slumber that lasts seven days. Being that what follows this prolonged slumber is Orlando's transition from male to female, these seven days of evolutionary metamorphosis are linked to Betsky's assertion that the closet aspect of queer space operates as an artificial womb that is both biologically and artificially constructing Orlando's new identity. Even when rioters infiltrate and violate the room wherein Orlando is in his trance, they left him primarily untouched, as the closet space is one of security and privacy. The three facilitators of Orlando's physical sex change are the three ladies, Our Lady of Purity, Chastity, and Modesty. Most scholars contest that these ladies are representative of the negative aspects of social reformation and restrictions on individuality. Caroline Webb writes that these ladies are creating a kind of mask scene surrounding this event. And a mask scene would be you know, defined as a form of courtly dramatic entertainment, often richly symbolic in which music and dancing played a substantial part. Costumes and stage machinery tended to be elaborate and the audience might be invited to contribute to the action or the dancing. Webb's comparison between Orlando's sex change and a mask scene attributes her, information, her transformation to something open to the public as a kind of form of entertainment. However, no audience is invited to contribute to the action of concealing Orlando's new biological identity that Webb describes as being her Orlando's naked and disturbing sexuality. Webb writes that the audience is meant to feel sympathy for Orlando and see a clear staging of this mask scene, which reveals the absurdity of the drama through the voices and actions of the three ladies. Another scholar, Karen E. Westman, similarly attributes this scene to a mask scene. She writes that the three ladies are meant to highlight Wolf's satire on the hypocrisy of such claims to truth, candor, and honesty. It is the satirical approach that Westman claims to further reveal how ignorance and greed masquerade behind their seemingly pure draperies of faith and social respectability. However, when reading this scene through Betsky's lens of a queer closet space, previous scholarship falls short. I attest that it is these three ladies who instead create a subversively queer closet space for Orlando. Through their desperate actions to conceal Orlando's new female body, the three ladies are creating that closet space for Orlando to privately create her new identity away from the material world and expectations of it. To maintain Orlando's privacy, the three ladies, who facilitate Orlando's sudden biological sex change, create their own kind of closet space that offers Orlando physical privacy from the material world, a sense of security, and a space for Orlando to both construct and be constructed into his new identity as a biological female. Orlando's space is then fully left to her solitude as the three ladies leave. Orlando is alone in this queer space as the ladies close the door behind them as if to shut out something they dare not look upon. Orlando's queer closet space has been constructed for her alongside the construction of her identity. Orlando emerges from her queer closet space into the space of the mirror wherein she has her first bodily encounter with herself as a woman. Ex employing Betsky's conception of the mirror, Orlando merely sees a fleeting reflection of her physical body in the mirror. Aforementioned, the mirror is a bodily experience in that it provides the onlooker with a visual view of their physical body. It is where you and your world, including your body, your clothes, and the objects you have collected around yourself, come back to you in an ordered fashion. As Orlando sees herself, she sees herself outside of gendered identity. At this moment, Orlando has not experienced the, so the societal constraints of her newfound sex. She only sees Orlando, a kind of third sex. Through this moment, Wolf is inextricably linking memory and identity to the physical object and queer space of and within the mirror. 
Not only does the mirror provide a reflection of oneself, but it also provides a space within itself for all things to come together to shape the reflection. As she looks in the mirror, it is the past memories, current portraits, and the future that come together in unison to create Orlando's current mirrored reflection. This realization of seeing her new identity through her physical body in the queered space of the mirror further triggers a reshaping of Orlando's previous identity through memory. As Orlando thinks of her past memories as she inhabits this queer mirror space, a kind of pronoun slippage occurs. Within a few subsequent sentences, the biographer refers to Orlando first as he, second as they, third as he again, and finally as she. This brief moment of an almost joint identity between male and female Orlando highlights how it is only Orlando's physical body that has been affected by her becoming a biological woman. Christy L. Burns contests that the pronoun slippage highlights that the self here is a collection of many possible sexualities. The biographer's intentionality behind the pronoun slippage creates a single identity determined by memory chains that further the existence of a disidentification present in identity. Identity is always plural and unaffected by one's physical appearance as highlighted through Orlando's indifference to her new female body. This pronoun slippage further triggers Orlando's memory wherein she and the biographer return to her past to alter the existing masculine pronouns of he, him, his to her new feminine pronouns of she, her, hers. Other than her pronouns, nothing about her previous memories change besides certain things becoming a little dimmed. Rather than experiencing one final apex or metaphorical orgasm wherein she has one solitary moment of pleasure, Orlando instead experiences two key moments in her life in which all other moments fade away. The first being her meeting with Shell and the second being her time in the present moment. There's a significant crossover between the applications of Betsky's The Space of Orgasm and Wolf's Moments of Being, as theorized in a sketch of the past. Most of a person's life is spent in a state of non-being in which they are not living consciously. This is a state of cotton wool that shrouds the mind and eyes from living in reality. Specifically, this can entail monotonous tasks such as washing, cooking, dinner, and bookbinding. Wolf writes that much of her childhood and adulthood were spent in this cotton wool state, apart from the memory of a fist fight she had with her brother, Toby. This moment ignited a sudden violent shock, pulling Wolf into a conscious moment within reality. This, constitute one of, this constitutes one of Wolf's moments of being, which she welcomes because of their ability to make her truly feel alive. In connection to Betsky, these moments of being also cause one to enter a space in which the body dissolves into the world and the senses smooth all reality into continuous waves of pleasure. Serving as an apex, these moments are at the center of one's experiences. As aforementioned, Orlando experiences two key moments in her life in which all other moments fade away. These two moments display both a queering of time and space through the narrative. Even though the time between Shell and Orlando's original meeting and marriage is short, it still lasted at least a night and a morning. However, Orlando later refers to the series of events as lasting in the space of three seconds and a half. For Orlando and Shell to experience this shared moment in relationship grounded in queerness, they must exist in their own queer space outside of and on the margins of heteronormative space. It is not only time that is queered in this scene, but also space. Orlando and Shell are, mar are married in a chapel, which is typical of a heteronormative relationship. However, there is no planning, true ceremony, or structure to the event. Rather than an engagement, it is the wind that ignites and begins the whirlwind of a swift engagement and wedding ceremony. The wind dresses the two of them with leaves as they run through the woods, gathering servants and people as they ran. Similarly to the people trying to interrupt and penetrate Orlando's sex change, here Wolf creates a hectic space wherein both the living and non-living are trying to penetrate and disturb the lover's unity. This scene features what can be attributed to heteronormative societal forces attempting to penetrate and disturb the wedding ceremony. The uproar is not only audible through the sounds of the convoluted wedding band made up of doors slamming, pots banging, and an organ playing, but also visual through the show of light and shadows through the chapel windows. After the rings are distributed and adorned on their fingers, Shell and Orlando depart in a frenzy on horseback out of the chapel and presumably back into the woods. Their cries of each other's names are seen dashing and circling like wild hawks together among the bellfires and higher and higher, further and further, till they crashed and fell in a shower of fragments to the ground. The lovers' words breaking apart into fragments wherein they shower them and rejoin them and rejoin the earth alludes to a queer space being created through the space of orgasm, a kind of transformative apex for the couple. This is the space in which their bodies are dissolving into the world and their senses smoothing all reality into continuous waves of pleasure. Everything else has faded, including the chaos, movement, and confusion surrounding the ceremonial wedding space. 
All that remains are Shell and Orlando, now married. Orlando explicitly experiences fear for the present moment for the first time in the novel in the last chapter. Realizing she is in the present, Orlando becomes afraid and uncomfortable with her current place in time. For what more terrifying revelation can there be than there is than the present, than, than that is the present moment. That we survive this shock at all is only possible because the past shelters us on one side, the future on another. This moment of being can be likened more to Wolf's theorization of these moments of being as a sudden shock that pulls one into the present moment. Other than the shared term shock, the present moment here is both a metaphorical and physical space grounded in nuance and difference. It is during this present moment that Orlando thinks of the passing of time and how she is aged. Time has passed over me, she thought, trying to collect herself. This is the oncome of middle age, how strange it is. Time and space begin to queer as Orlando lives in both England and Turkey within the time of her mind and body. This time is existing beyond the time of the clock and as space begins to reform. I take up a handbag and I think of an old bum boat woman frozen in the ice. Someone lights a pink candle and I see a girl in Russian trousers. What is it I taste? Little herbs. I hear goat bells. I see mountains. Turkey, India, Persia, the bare mountains of Turkey were before her. Orlando is simultaneously living in the time and space of England and Turkey. These places have become one wherein she looks or feels one way and is returned to somewhere she is not meant to be. The present moment showers down upon her head as she feels the life and consciousness carried by the early 20th century. Thank you. So excited to hear it because I love when people write about Wolf's essays. So Tanya, take it away. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share a PowerPoint and I think what I'll do as I read my essay um, is not read the, the quotes and instead you'll see them on the PowerPoint for the sake of time. And I'm also be, gonna be skipping over a few sections um, just in case you're reading along. So um, I'm looking at a room of one's own and I'll look first at her use of binary gendered language and how in some small way she, sub she subverts, collapses, or re reimagines the gender binary, and then talk about the culturally constructed self, um, specifically of the woman in Britain and its material implications, and then a deeper reading of self as layered, dynamic, multifaceted, and contingent, and how this can be a theoretical location from which to examine gender. And then I'll go into what I think is the ethical payoff of um, the whole paper. And so as you see the words fly onto the page here, um, these are just a small fraction of the gendered binary language that Wolf uses in A Room of One's Own. It's just absolutely rife with this kind of language. And um, growing up in the gendered Stephen household and in England under the rule of patriarchy, this is the language that Wolf has handed. She published A Room of One's Own in 1929, two decades before Simone de Beauvoir claimed one is born, but not born, but rather becomes woman. And before subsequent theorists made the critical distinctions between gender and sex. In many respects, Wolf's observations on gender are hemmed in by her reliance on what we now understand as gender binarist language and thinking. She uses the terms women and men repeatedly, detailing characteristics of these two opposite categories. She also terms, uses the terms woman and female or man and male synonymously and interchangeably. She uses sex when today we would use the term gender. Yet she uses this clumsy language to convey novel ideas for her time. There are few instances in which she employs conventional language to quietly subvert the gender binary. In particular, she uses a patriarchal trope based on religion and the utility of female bodies to describe the state of mind necessary to produce quality writing in which she deems that the male and female parts of the writer's mind must merge. Creation, marriage, consummated, all concepts from patriarchal Christian ideology. In the same vein, she repeatedly refers to the mind as having to be fertilized. But here's an instance in which Wolf plays with gender and sex. 
In reversal of the traditional metaphor, the man is described as barren with his dried ideas and his sterile mind, which must be fertilized by the woman in order for his creative ideas to quicken. According to gender essentialism, only women as females can be fertilized by males. But in this instance, the woman takes on the active role of fertilizing the male mind, which would otherwise be barren. Likewise, barren females have no use in patriarchal society. But in Wolf's formulation, the male becomes useless. So although Wolf relies on traditional patriarchal tropes to conceptualize the creative mind, in this instance, she uses the language of patriarchy to turn the gender binary on its head. In yet another passage, she plays with the idea of collapsing the gender binary. In spite of the fact that she conceives of two genders as inherently opposed, doing so is an arduous mental undertaking for Wolf. And if each gender is not distinct from the other, as Wolf comes close to surmising here, it implies that binary gender categories must not necessarily be absolute. They may even be a fiction and she makes an incremental move towards collapsing the gender binary. Wolf imagines letting go of the effort of conceptualizing two opposing genders and thereby experiencing mental unity, drawing the binaries together, collapsing them into one another as if by gravitational force. But Wolf remains conditioned by her culture. She stops short of imagining that society's concept of gender could instead burst outward in every direction generating stars of infinite variety. There is however one moment in which she imagines, imagines the possibility of a more diversely gendered world. She argues, again adhering to binary language, that for the sake of variety, women should not aspire to write like men. Yet she complicates her idea. She builds her argument on binary gendered thinking and simultaneously recognizes its inadequacy. She goes on to imagine the existence of other sexes or genders. She recognizes the benefits of a diversely gendered world, but she doesn't acknowledge or perhaps understand that people of other sexes exist alongside her, peering through the branches of Britain's oaks and beaches, alders and birches, looking up at her familiar northern skies. Perhaps the reason that Wolf's writing exhibits these flickers of non-binary thinking on gender is that while Wolf uses the terms woman and man liberally to describe human beings and the literature they produce, she would have understood a woman and a man in line with de Beauvoir as made rather than an essential state of being. She would have seen the categories of woman and man as culturally constructed, conferring upon the human subject a gendered aspect of their social identity or social self. Women's social selves are constructed to a large extent through patriarchal narrative. While researching in the British Museum Library, Wolf uncovers the strangely varying ways in which male British writers have constructed the female subject over a span of centuries and the ways in which men depict and construct the idea of women define and circumscribe women's lives. The hypothetical Judith Shakespeare, equally gifted as her brother, was shaped by cultural forces that denied her schooling, almost forced her into marriage, laughed her out of the theater and took advantage of her sexually. She died in shame and obscurity. Even Jane Austen, whom Wolf credits with superior writing, was reduced to producing her work in the sitting room of a home in a village that she hardly ventured from. Cultural forces bequeathed each of these women gendered social identities or social selves that to some extent defined their lives. Wolf articulates the psychic and material effects of patriarchal narratives on women. One outcome of these oppressive narratives is women's material poverty. Her argument is built on the premise that women lack freedom to write as they might wish to because of their poverty. She details the sumptuous luncheon at the men's college versus her plain meal at the women's college. The vastly different meals subsidized at vastly different rates result from the accumulation of wealth by men over centuries. Wolf understands that a gendered social self is culturally constructed and thereby to some degree artificial. And she likewise understands that the positionality of the culturally constructed self has serious material implications. 
For this reason, she deliberately emphasizes the gender binary to highlight the subordinate position of British women. Wolf theorizes a culturally constructed social self and uses the category women to draw attention to the, that group's material poverty. She also understands the self in its entirety as not merely a fixed so cultural construction. Her example of how to write a believable woman character illustrates her conception of a layered, dynamic, multifaceted, and contingent self. Wolf argues that to write real women characters, one must address multiple layers of selfhood, both their inner lives and the facts of their social identities. The writer must think poetically and prosaically at the same moment. As part of this process, Wolf collapses another set of binaries, the inner self and the social self. The culturally constructed self on its own is a hollow shell, operated according to cultural blueprints, devoid of life. And a character's inner life is meaningless without cultural structures within which to contain and explain experience. Both are necessary for existence, each relies on the other. Her fictional character, Mrs. Martin's marital status, gender, age, and unfashionable attire attest to her solidity and assign her a definite place in the British social fabric. And yet sticking solely to these facts renders her character inert. Rather, Wolf recognizes Mrs. Martin as a dynamic being, much more than a collection of cultural signifiers. Her body, defined and shaped by the socio-cultural world, the scaffolding upon which her social self is constructed is simultaneously imbued with dynamic inner life. Only the outward aspects of the character are static. Her inner life is perpetually pulsing and shifting. Because of this dynamism, as Wolf explains in a different context, any unique self may rise to the surface at any moment. Each instance of spirits and forces coursing and flashing is a moment of lived experience that constitutes a fleeting self arising from a multiplicity of potential selves. Ultimately, Wolf believes the human subject has no fixed or absolute self. The selves that come into being moment by moment, constantly constructed and deconstructed, are contingent on flashes of inner experience, which are reciprocally influenced by a subject's social position within the material world. In this manner, she complicates the relationship between binary states, poetics and prosaics, inner experience and social constructions, and allows novel creative ways of being to arise in the world. Rather than Wolf's overall argument or her use of language, it is Wolf's concept of self that is the theoretical location from which to challenge binary thinking about gender and investigate one of her many contributions to the intellectual legacy that has helped give rise to gender studies. First off, when one realizes that the social self is culturally constructed, in part through the cultural narrative that dictates adherence to binary genders, one no longer must accept the culturally constructed self as natural or predetermined. Once one identifies cultural constructions, one may begin to deconstruct or refashion them theoretically and or actually. This is easier, but not necessarily easy for transgender folks than it is for cis folks, as trans folks lived experiences with gender identity and expression inherently challenge the dominant binarist narrative. Gender theorist Gloria and Saldua describes a process with which to challenge the narrative. She writes about the mestiza who from the ambiguous position in the borderlands between race country, language, and culture gains insights with which they may creatively emancipate themselves from patriarchal paradigms. She makes similar observations about a gender non-conforming neighbor. Inhabiting more than just one binary gender within one's lifetime makes cultural constructs visible and allows a person to enact possibilities outside the culturally constructed gender binary. Secondly, as we have seen, Wolf's conception of self is much more than a container fashioned by society. Wolf's self is dynamic and contingent. Lived experience arises in vastly rich and varied ways in every new moment as the human subject perceives phenomena from their positionalities in the socio-cultural and material worlds. Each moment of lived experience gives rise to a fleeting self. 
Using this logic, one can assume that the human subject may experience flashes of attachment to either of the binary genders, both genders, or neither gender through the lenses of their various intersectionalities. This plurality of possible selves allows one to define one's gender for oneself and allows for a range of gendered experience in which people may imagine and enact alternate ways of being in the world, or at least on infinite shifting points along the gender spectrum. This holds with findings from Daniel Kyle Sutherland's recent research into how trans folks draw symbolic boundaries around the community. One approach to boundary drawing that he terms unbounded entails, quote, the wide and inclusive acknowledgement of all transgender identities and expressions that may fall under the trans umbrella. Ideologically unbounded participants in a study believe that a legitimate trans identity rested solely on one's ability to come to terms with a personal sense of their gender identity. And in keeping with the ideas above, they actively seek to challenge, deconstruct, and reconstruct wider variations of trans enough identity borders. Allowing any possible gendered self to arise out of one's lived experience offers every individual the freedom that Wolf so keenly longs for on the behalf of cis women. And here I will skip forward a little bit. Um, Wolf theorizes an androgynous or nuanced bi-gendered mind. And that she writes, albeit in the context of the writer's mind and craft. It is fatal to be man or woman, pure and simple. One must be womanly, woman manly or man womanly. It is fatal to the literary work to write dry, unstructured male prose, and it is equally fa fatal to let the words run freely across the page. It is fatal to force every human being into the category of man or woman. It is fatal to accept rigid constructions as the truth of the world ignoring the life force radiating from within them. Seeing the cultural or linguistic construction for what it is, simply a container, sometimes useful, often oppressive, is what allows the creative life force, gendered or otherwise, inside to shine. In a room of one's own, Virginia Woolf chronicles the numerous obstacles placed before cis women who had up until that moment in time aspired to write fiction in the British tradition. She concludes that women's creative impulses must not be stifled, and therefore women must not be subjected to reduced material circumstances or oppressive psychic circumstances. She exhorts women to write about everything and to collectively contribute toward the creative freedom and material well being of women poets of the future. Perhaps in 100 years' time, when Wolf postulates that women will have ceased to be the protected sex. In 2022, approximately 100 years after A Room of One's Own was written, women still face discrimination, but in many regards, cis women have made significant gains. Given that Wolf's anti-fascist ethic likely contributed to the cultural current from which gender theory arose, it follows that we have an ethical imperative to include the material and psychic well-being of trans individuals in Wolf's exhortation as well. One must only glance at the news to see the overwhelming number of attacks on the trans community, from the denial of gender affirming care to discriminatory bathroom laws to laws limiting the participation of trans women athletes and tragic acts of violence against trans individuals. In the end, Wolf doesn't title her essay Women in Fiction, but rather A Room of One's Own. Although she writes about cis women, the non gender title confers on them full personhood and could be read as inclusive of persons of any gender. The rooms that Wolf's imagined women live in are varied. They're calm or thunderous. They give under a prison yard or are hung with washing. Some rooms are alive with opals and silks. Others are as hard as horsehair or as soft as feathers. Since Wolf's time, we've collectively become aware that the rooms human beings live in are much more varied than even those of the women that Wolf imagined. In the end, we must be compelled to work towards societies in which we not only make room for each of us by accepting and celebrating gender diversity, but also in which there are rooms for each of us so that every person may fully engage with and benefit from the collective resources of the community. In this manner, every human being may have the opportunity to live life in the presence 
live in the presence of reality and invigorating life. Thank you. So we've reached everyone's favorite part of the panel, um, Q&A. I am genuinely excited about it. Um, and I think, Madeline, if you're happy to start, because you, I think, posted the first question in the chat. Um, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, can you hear me? OK, good. Um, so I loved all the papers. They were really good and they were really good together. So thank you for this great uh, panel. And um, Gwen, I just had a, uh, a quick question that might have a long answer and maybe not have an answer at all. But um, I am really curious about how we think about the genre difference between the two texts. We've got, you know, this sort of novel about a person who lives over 300 years and <clears throat> Uh, is called the biography, even though it's a novel. And then we have um, this uh, autobiography or some kind of, I was, I like to think of it as a sort of communally written biography because other people had a hand in it. Um, and that might make a difference as to how it's read, you know, just in terms of the intentionality of the author, if we're even allowed to bring that into the conversation. So it's a curious question, and but one I think that would be interesting to sort out. Absolutely, it's a great question. And of course, Pamela and Sabine do so much good work with that exact question in that scholarly edition. Um, just discussing the, the difficulty of defining uh, man into woman generically. And, and so for me, there wasn't enough time to sort of get into the, uh, specifics of, oh, here's where I'm going with this, or this is the choice I've made here. But I almost just want to, it's it's so complex, in fact, that I almost just want to look at Lily as presented in the text, as a literary figure. Here's Lily in the text. What does she say in the text? Let's, let's ignore the, okay, this was her real life. This is the complication. This is what goes into this. No, no. What does she say in there? Acknowledging that it's very complex, but just saying, okay, well, this is what we have this character actualizing, like almost like a character, right? We know that she was a historical person, but let's take what's in the text, given that it's so complex and there were so many constructing voices. Um, I was just rereading that sort of introductory passage like yesterday that talks about um, ascribing authorship, almost impossible, so muddy. So just just all like not ignoring it completely, but but saying okay, well that we need to just think of this as a literary figure, and that actually allows us to compare her with Orlando a little more easily, saying well they're both characters in a literary text, and let's think of them that way. Let's what do they, what do they have in common? What do they do differently in that context? Does that make sense? That's what I was trying to do with it. Yeah, no, it makes sense, and I, and I think that's probably the only way to handle it. So then then the question would be. We need to be mindful of how we're reading. It's about the reader that your uh, your main thrust of your argument is. We need to be mindful as readers how we are reading, which is interesting because you know that's generally how we read or misread. Often misread gender anyway in persons, right? Because usually we don't look under the clothes, you know, unless we're really close to that person. So we're always reading gender, right? It, we're always reading gender often wrong too. So um, so that might be interesting too, that connection between reading and reading that you're um, bringing out with your paper. Yeah, and Orlando says so much about close too. I know folks have written about that. It was you, I think you have as well. <laughs> um, and that almost is just where I come full circle to. I think this comes up in Donald Sutherland a little bit too. I hadn't heard of Sutherland before. So thank you for that, Tanya. And I absolutely need to read that work. I need to, I need to, I need to think, sit with that one too. He's clearly saying a lot of, of valuable things about this as well. But that how a person articulates their own identity, that's the only way to go, right? We can't read from the outside. We need to say, well, okay, well, what? Just, just tell me what is your own version of yourself. Perfect. I'll go with that because that's you telling me what you are. Perfect. Great. 
And and I guess what I'm struggling with in Orlando is just sometimes Orlando doesn't do that. It's like, well, tell us, give us that interiority that we see in the rest of Wolf. Why is Orlando not doing that? Tanya, you should definitely speak to this. Well, I was um, thinking about Emanuela's um, paper in which she talks about the closet, right? And Orlando just goes into a trance and all this stuff is happening around them. But um, that would be the perfect moment, that moment of solitude, right? Of aloneness for that introspection to happen. Um, Yeah, I, if I can add to that, since, you know, <laughs> but um, as I was listening to you present, Gwen, I was thinking about how you're kind of bringing into um, account how this is kind of like this love letter for Vita in a way. And in the way that I kind of read it in the longer version of this paper is that, you know, that Vita, that the novel Orlando is that closet space for Vita. It's offering this kind of possibility for other possible selves that she could possibly explore. It's kind of opening that space. It's kind of, I guess, like a pseudo open closet, you know, um, cause we can all see it. Right. Um, but so I think it's like her gift was creating this both physical and metaphorical closet for her lover Vita, right. To be able to kind of explore those possible selves that you were kind of referencing as you were presenting. Yeah, lots to think about. Uh, thank you, Madeline, for this question and to our panelists for their really varied answers. Um, I think the next question was Pamela, and then we have a raised hand from Basha. Um, Pamela, do you want to speak your question or should we just, should I read it for you? Uh, no, I'm happy to recap. I thought because I had quotes, I put it in the chat rather than just asking the question. I was, it was more an observation bringing the papers together. So. I noted that uh, slide, Tanya, where you had the quote, uh, material effects of social construction. I thought that's so clearly presented in the uh, sex change scene of Orlando that Emanuela was talking about with purity, chastity, modesty. That not many people comment on that passage of their speech when they go back to London. They're like, okay, we we'll go, we'll go back to where we're still worshipped and admired. And that's because the foundations of British empire depends on holding that binary in place. Um, so I think that is really crucial. And then I wanted to compare, as I just did in my graduate course on Wednesday, that passage with the passage from Hirschfeld's Transvestite that work published in 1910 was the first work to distinguish sexual orientation from gender identity. And Hirschfeld used the word that he said was inadequate, but transvestism for both cross-dressing and what we would call transgender. And in that passage, he too makes that same point that the notion that we are men or women is passed over into the flesh and blood of all of us and it it holds up the foundations of government or religion. So he's looking as well as a, at the material effects of that social construction. And I think we can't lose sight of that. It's so important not to think it's just something we've come up with, uh, you know, circa 1980s or 90s or something. Um, but I also think it's a, it's a way of reading um, these three papers together, bringing out the same point. And Gwen, as to your point, I really appreciated your comment of seeing Lily, as you said, another figure of literary modernism who undergoes transition. I like that wording very much because it, it puts Lily's story in the context of so many modernists like Adels Huxley's Richard Greenow or Sherwood Anderson, the man who became a woman, um, not just Orlando, but all these works that are, are using that figure. And usually people want to forget that Lily is a character and go to talking about her actual experience. And she did not write this narrative. So she's not the sole author of her identity to quote, uh, you quoted Prosser on that. You can't say that about Lily. Plus she also said, I'm the product of my partner's art, 
you know, because she brought Lily out in her paintings of the modern woman and of the art of the professor who did the surgeries on her. So she she's a very complex figure. And I really appreciate the way you put her into literary modernism as a figure. It, it shows no disrespect whatsoever. On the contrary, I think it's important to give us a way of reading her as character. So thank you all for a wonderful panel. Just great. Thank you so much, Pamela. <clears throat> that was really wonderful. All right, Varsha, go ahead, please. really really enjoyed that um it's amazing and i think that my question is actually touching on um all these conversations um that are happening um but my question is um i also agree that we have it, it's a great way in to read uh lily and orlando as literary characters however we I think that there are ethics of biofiction that we really need to consider here, right? Because, um, for example, uh, Emanuela was saying that this is a sort of gift to Rita to be all of these different selves. Um, however, in your paper, and maybe I have misunderstood it, I um, you were sort of saying that Rita had more of a trans sensibility than her fictionalized um, Orlando figure. And in that case, if you're fictionalizing that biographical subject, perhaps she erases that trans sensibility while fictionalizing that biographical subject. So I feel like there are really great ethical implications here uh, in terms of, of that kind of you know, genre. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. I'd be happy to speak to that if nobody else wants to as well. But um, yeah, Brenda Helch has, has a lot of great things to say. It's the one in Queer Bloomsbury, uh, the article in there. And I can post the name after. Sort of discussing, yeah, the way that Vita saw herself. And then of course, you know, she's the inspiration for Orlando. Of course, Orlando is not a direct biography either, right? It's that same thing where you take something and you make a character out of it. But the, I, I, I would agree that there are certain ethical implications of saying, oh, this is meant to be a tribute to Vita, but we're not necessarily going to bring in this way that Vita conceptualized her own sexuality slash gender. You know, at the time in, in the twenties, right? They're very conjoined in, 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 in the, the, the sexological theories that are present at the time. So they're not necessarily separating those but what Orlando, what we see in Orlando is not necessarily what, what Vita, how, how Vita articulated it. Um, and again, Brenda Helt uh, specifically highlights where Wolf saw things differently and that, yeah, she chose to sort of go her own way with it based on her own views. Yeah, I think there's an ethical implication to that. Uh, it's not something I had enough time to, to talk about. It wasn't like the main thrust of my comparison, but I, I think it's a relevant point. And, and I would have to do further reading, you know, especially on Vita. Um, I'm, I'm deeply interested in, in exploring that further as well. And I, I want to thank you for bringing that up. Cassia, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Go ahead. Yeah, perfectly. Hello, you all. Can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a little bit of a crying for help. <laughs> I'm a PhD student from Brazil, and I'm working on my thesis with Orlando being read under the perspective of Simone de Beauvoir's second sex. And I reflect upon these exact motives Gwen addressed in her work, which Wolf uses to talk about the social roles and relations between masculine and feminine. But one of my fears, though, is that my discussion may reinforce the binary vision that the current studies are trying to fight against. So I don't know, I'm just sharing this concern of mine. Somehow your papers and all that have been discussed so far will already help me a lot on that. But I would like to hear a bit more of the panelists 
thoughts on that. So thank you. Sure. So um, the way that I guess I kind of approached this paper at first was I was looking at it through how, you know, androgyny was mobilizing this kind of queer space and time for Orlando in the novel um, as kind of like, you know, as this transformation transformed, you know, without being a trans character, but as androgyny being this kind of androgynously queer character who does not necessarily adhere to either binary, but is placed under these binaries how that is kind of moving forward and maintaining that kind of ambiguity or, you know, uh, I guess I struggle to even call Orlando a non-binary character, right? I, I feel more comfortable just saying androgynously queer because it keeps kind of the ambigu uh, ambiguity alive. But um, I think that, you know, maintaining just that kind of conversation of how those social and material implications surrounding those two binary sexes that Orlando does kind of fall under in different portions of the novel, kind of maintaining how androgyny is mobilizing those things or working together with those things kind of maintains that part of the novel that, you know, Wolf is referring to. And if I may speak for a moment, um, de Beauvoir really talks about how the woman is socially constructed. The, the idea of the woman is socially constructed. And so I feel like if you highlight that point, you're gonna get away from that sort of um, binary gender essentialism. Um, and we've constructed these ideas of what it means to be a man, to be a woman. And, um, and once you see through that, then I think you can discuss Orlando with, with less of a sort of essentialist binary perspective. We have a few more minutes, so. Oh yeah, Anne, go ahead. Thank you. This is kind of a naive question and it's more about my own um, kind of nascent work with Sarah Ahmed um, and queer uses and queer uses of space in particular. So I'm struck by the um, concept of the closet as queer space. Um, in particular, I guess Betsky's um, conceptualization of it as a womb, which I'm I can't help but think about confinement and like a woman's confinement during pregnancy and how there, there are two sides to that. And then Tanya, your work with the room and thinking back to that passage from a room of one's own where she's thinking about how unpleasant it is to be locked out and worse perhaps to be locked in. And how these, I think this goes back to perhaps ambiguity and perhaps ambivalence but also the, the uses of these kinds of spatial conceptualizations of inner and outer space or external and internal definitions of self. Anyway, I'm just, I'm, so yeah, as I say, an incoherent kind of reflection on space. Thank you. Okay, I'll just mute now. <laughs> Is how, how can these, these spaces, um, I guess, be queer spaces or be spaces that are are subject to queer uses and where freedom is a constant negotiation, being free to have something to be yourself. I'm wondering if that's been figuring into to your work with that, both this notion of confinement and freedom um, through space, if that makes sense, maybe not, sorry. Yeah, so with, uh, you know, once Aaron Betsky's kind of uh, text was kind of like the big aha moment when I was kind of working through this paper, I finally found that source. And it was like, like, I almost cried tears of joy. I was like, I finally am understanding what's going on in this text. But I think in terms of confinement and this kind of solitude is that not only does it kind of reflect Orlando's own personality, to want to be in solitude as both a man and a woman and you know all those other selves in between. But it also is kind of reflected in the different ways that Orlando is the is mothers, it, you know, this kind of uh, broader term, but because Orlando is kind of the birth giver of the poem, is the birth giver of a child. And you know, how Orlando as mother kind of plays these different roles where 
you know, maybe certain restrictions on her motherhood towards her child versus how she kind of has this kind of freedom and self-discovery through being the mother of the poem and kind of how those are being compared. Um, and, you know, creating those both physical and more metaphorical queer spaces throughout the novel following this kind of how is confinement being played is is it being used in kind of a positive or a negative kind of outlook through Orlando as the character? What is it kind of benefiting or, you know, um, kind of hurting in the text or what is, what is it inhibiting for the reader? What are we not getting because of this queer space? And what are we getting because of the queer space? So it's kind of like this, two things are kind of happening, I feel like. Um, but I guess if that kind of answers your question, those are just thoughts that are coming out of your thoughts, I guess. Oh, I love that. Um... That's the question always, isn't it? Who does this benefit or what are the benefits and what are what are being inhibited rather than inhabited? So that that very, very much clarifies. I think maybe that circles back around to our, our description, of, our discussion of, you know, the social constructedness too, and specifically English society. So Orlando, I think Jessica Berman has written a little bit of this, the transnational, uh, you know, element of Orlando where Orlando goes to Constantinople, and this is where this takes place. It takes place outside of the realm of England. And then as, as Emmanuel noted too, right, during this seven days of deep sleep trance, so there's two ways in which, or two, two steps in which Orlando is removed from outside influences in order for this to take place, in order for this gestational process to happen. And then when returning to England, those problems return. The social, the nature of the social construction of gender and and the gender roles that Orlando has to grapple with. And of course, there's a bit of a romanticism of of the of the foreign here as well. And Jessica Berman does talk about that, but it's because you know it's it's a, deal, a novel of Englishness in many ways. It's when Orlando returns to England that all of a sudden these things slap her in the face and she's like, oh wow, like I can't even show my ankle. <laughs> um, I highly recommend to everyone that you read Madeline's article on camp because it's it's it just highlights the the total hilariousness of that moment. I love the way that you put that. Um, and that that closet, it works well. I like that concept, but it seems to work well. Yeah, when it's when you're allowed to be outside of the space of expectations or requirements or outside influences versus being closeted. Let's say in the in the heart of English society or in the heart of our society today, being closeted can be a very painful experience. And busting out can be very, very important. But Orlando gets to have a different experience of that, right? If that if that seven day trance is, is this sort of womb like period, it's allowed to happen in a way that isn't so jarring or or restrictive or just uh, traumatic. Right. Yeah. And when I, I find it really interesting, you know, with Orlando coming out of this closet space is more, you know, this kind of the way that we think about being in the closet is, as you are saying, like for many people, extremely traumatic. So, uh, but, you know, Orlando basically waltzes out, you know, does like a little tiptoe dance, does a like, like what is going on? And then it's like, oh, hey, it's me. And then like, let's move on. And then it's social implications ruin everything. So it's really interesting how that kind of is influencing readers perspective of like how does Orlando like really feel like until the societal implications are being introduced into the text we're kind of left with like nonchalantness melancholy it's just like no biggie you know it's the same as like oh my blinds are open now now they are closed and everything is the same it's just kind of like like no big deal and so that's why kind of looking through it as she kind of enters this mirrored space and then into the kind of outside world where she has finally kind of left that privacy and you know she's not truly private because we're reading about her story she's she's never truly alone right so we are kind of onlookers of this entire you know uh experience through her kind of vacillation between these different gender identities but she kind of it's once those material items are coming together that things start to really change or things start to really become apparent for Orlando in a way that kind of highlights those social implications implications and societal expectations specifically that of a woman in her time or her time you know during that section of the novel 
And I can say something really briefly about rooms in a room of one's own. Um, I had never really thought of it before writing this paper at the room as a queer space. Um, but looking at the multiplicity of rooms, um, I thought of it that way. But I would say, again, it's it's um, the culturally constructed self or woman who is locked out of the library, locked into the home, and um, and Wolf uses these mo this motif of architecture repeatedly in terms of like building structure, um, which is again, I think symbolic for um, patriarchy. And um, so I could see it's an interesting, yeah, I, I, I'm making some new connections. So thank you. All right, we have time for last words from our panelists. Um, but if no one has any last words, I just want to thank the other two panelists. Uh, yeah. I thought everyone was amazing. It was it's just such a pleasure to be here. That's that's it. It was so nice to meet you and hear your, your wonderful work. Likewise, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, big round of applause. Thank you everyone so much for, as uh, someone said in the chat, probably my favorite panel yet. Um, also, thank you to our audience for incredible questions and just a great discussion. And yeah, I'm so excited to see all of you across different panels the next few days and hopefully next year as well. All right.